uh, look to your neighbor and tell him, keep fighting. Come on, somebody, keep fighting. Uh, we are in a series uh, based on uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Let's look at our theme verse, and then we're going to join in together the good fight. It says, fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses today. Come on, can we just give God, say a big amen to God's word today? Fight the good fight for the true faith. So uh, during this series, uh, and this has uh, been a fun one so far, but what we're trying to do is help you uh, to know how to fight, who to fight. Uh, uh, many times I've been saying this, we gotta fight the good fight, not the wrong fight, the good fight. And if you fight the way the world fights, you're gonna lose the way the world loses. Uh, I, I wanna encourage you to fight the way God is calling us to fight. Uh, and so part of my question is, are you in a struggle today? Um, is there someone you're having a, a tough go at with and maybe it's uh, locally in home, maybe it's in the marriage, maybe it's a coworker or a friend. Uh, but here's what I know, uh, that God has given us the strategies and the tools uh, to win every fight. And, but we have to have the right concept and I, I'm not gonna go into this scripture today, but man, write this down and maybe study it. Ephesians 6 uh, gives us a, a framework for fighting, and it says this, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Your fight is not with the person in front of you or beside you, uh, that there is a real enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And so the enemy's always baiting us and inviting us to fight the wrong fight, while God is inviting us to fight the good fight. The enemy is always inviting us to pick up the wrong weapons. Uh, God's always inviting us to pick up the right weapons. And so uh, I just believe that today, God's gonna use this word uh, to help somebody win. And so uh, that's my desire. But I think this is a word for our church as well on how we do church, uh, but also how we follow Jesus. And so um, every week, um, I, what I've been praying is, is that God would give me like a phrase or a quote that, most of you've probably heard before in the boxing or fighting world uh, and make it translate. My kids give me a hard time all the time. They say, Dad, you can turn anything into a message. Come on, somebody, you can turn anything into a message. And, and here's why. I believe that you can find God everywhere. Do you know God doesn't just exist in church? You know, God's at your workplace, God's at your school. God, wherever you go, if you will open your eyes, I believe that God wants to show you truth everywhere that you go. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's the case today. Now, last week, um, I used a famous guy named Mike Tyson uh, to preach about no pain, no gain. Today, um, by his own words, I'm gonna go back and quote uh, at least the guy who said he was the greatest of all time. Uh, and uh, I wanna go back before he was the greatest of all time. I wanna go back to 1964. Now, now here's the thing. We all know uh, stories from beginning to end, but you gotta kind of go back uh, to the beginning before this guy was famous. Um, in 1964, a boxer named Cassius Clay, uh, you will know him as Muhammad Ali, but before he was Muhammad Ali, he was Cassius Clay, uh, was getting ready to fight uh, the undefeated heavyweight champion of the world, Sony Liston, in 1964. Uh, and they made a mistake by putting a microphone in front of Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay loved to talk. Uh, and he quoted something. They said, how are you gonna beat this guy? He's unbeatable. Uh, he has never lost, and you're gonna lose. Everybody predicted that Cassius Clay was gonna lose. And they said, what is your strategy? And he actually gave a quote that became one of the most famous quotes of all time, yet it would only be famous if he won. Come on, somebody. Because if he would have lost, the quote would have died with him. But he won and then went on to win and to win and to win and became one of the greatest fighters of all time. Here's the title of my message today from Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, asking how was he gonna win. Here's what he said. He goes, here's my strategy. You know it. I am gonna what? I'm gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Come on, tell your neighbor. I'm gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Some of you are like, I don't know what in the world that even means, right? He said, man, I'm gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Here's what he was basically saying in fancy words. He said this, when I go fight him, he's not gonna be able to hit me, but I'm gonna hit him. I am gonna float like a butterfly, which means you cannot hit what you cannot see. And he said, I am gonna move around the ring so fast 
that he won't be able to lay a hand on me, and when he gets tired, I am gonna sting him like a bee. If you actually Google that phrase, this is powerful, uh, and I'll get to the, the word of God, which is where I really wanna hit at today, but if you kind of Google that phrase and float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, I say, what is the meaning of that phrase? Uh, and it literally comes out and says, it's the ult- ultimate combination between grace and power. Let's say it again. That, that statement, that phrase means this. He, he, here's what he said. I, my fighting strategy to win is I'm gonna be full of grace and I'm gonna be full of power. I'm gonna float like a butterfly and I'm gonna sting like a bee. Uh, you know, what he was really saying was, is I'm gonna play defense and I'm gonna play offense. You know, I, I think this is a great strategy for, for fighting, but how many know this? Uh, any football fans out there? Come on, football fans, make some noise. It's football season. Uh, my wife, I think football season is the greatest season that my wife thinks it's the biggest waste of time. Um, I, I, I try to tell my wife, if you're gonna enjoy something, you gotta go all in. The problem is you're not going all in. You're not picking a team. You need to be all in. Uh, and so I, I said, babe, but she doesn't get not only the hype around football, she doesn't get the hype that comes before football and after football. And I'm talking about all the talking heads that make millions of dollars talking about the game and then after the game. She goes, babe, it's bad enough that you'll watch a three-hour game. Why do you have to listen to grown men who don't play anymore talk about the game and then break it down after the game? But she don't get it. She don't understand. But maybe she does get it. But let me just say this. You know, those guys get paid millions of dollars. Always told my wife, like, if I wasn't a preacher, I would make the greatest sports commentary you've ever heard. Uh, Tony Romo ain't got nothing on me. Like, I, because I'm good with words. And I can see behind all their fancy words. You ever see a guy go, here's the key to the game. Let's talk about the keys to the game. Do you know that the keys to the game are the same every single game? (laughs) They say it in fancy words that make them famous. But if you really boil it down, here's what they're saying. Here's the key to the football game. This team has to stop that team from scoring. (laughs) And then this team has to score more than that team scores. Come on, somebody. That That is the strategy every day. If the Cowboys are gonna win, the defense has to stop their team from scoring and the offense has to score more points than they score. Are you with me today? They they make that sound really fancy. You know what that means? Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I'm gonna be really good at defense and also really good at offense. Um, I I was invited. I'm not a boxing fan, by the way, uh, but years ago, it was confirmed why. I had a friend invite me over to see uh, one of Money Mayweather's last fights. Come on, any Money Mayweather fans? No, I didn't think so. So let me just say, uh, so Money Mayweather was fighting, and he was, I said, what's the deal about whether they're like, he's undefeated, like he's never lost a fight. And so if I don't have a a chip in the game, if I don't have a team that I really like or don't like, I just pick the underdog every single time. Now, here's the type of friends I have. You would think my friend would invite me to see the game at his house for free. No, I think the real reason he invited is that he wanted more help paying for the (laughs) pay-per-view. He charged me to come to his house and watch a game. And then he had the audacity to say, bring some chips and dip. Come on, somebody, (laughs) be a good friend. Be a good friend, don't do that. And so I show up paying 25 bucks to go to his house to watch a game I don't care about. I had to bring chips and salsa. And then I said, when's it coming on? I'm there at like 7.30, 8 o'clock when he told me to be there. He goes, no, we gotta watch all the pre-fights. The pre-fights? I barely know the main fight. You want me to watch the pre-fights? By the way, rabbit trailing a little bit. Come on, somebody, like, like, it's just not that fun to watch. Some of you are into it, but where are my NASCAR fans at? Come on, any NASCAR fans? Make some noise, NASCAR fans. Yeah, I wouldn't either. Like, it's just the most boring, it's the most boring thing in the world. Someone invited me to the Richmond Speedway, like, Pastor, you're gonna love NASCAR. And so I show up and man, people are eating and having a good time. And then we get in the stands, it's going crazy. Gentlemen, start your engines, all this noise. And then they started. And then we all just did this for like <laughs> two and a half hours. And I know it sounds kind of sadistic. I was praying someone would get in a wreck. I mean, just (laughs) something happened. Something happened. Well, I'm watching this Money Mayweather fight. It finally comes on. They finally start fighting like at 1030 at night. And I'm like, well, I'm hoping this thing goes like like one round. I'm ready to go home. Like, I hope he knocks him out. And then about two and a half, three hours later, one o'clock in the morning, I'm like, what am I watching? 
I, I'm, I thought this guy was the greatest of all time. Oh, he is. Let me tell you, Money Mayweather took uh, Muhammad Ali's strategy to a whole nother level. The only reason he's 50 and 0 is because he dances more than Muhammad Ali ever danced ever. You can't touch him. Like he, like he took MC Hammer to a whole nother level. You can't touch this. And so he's dancing all over, and you can never lay a hit. And when he gets tired, he just knows I don't have to knock my opponent out to win. I just need to land enough punches that's more than he lands on me. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Now I know Muhammad Ali was great. I know Money Mayweather was really good at this strategy, but I, I, I'm here to tell us today, no one could fight like that with that strategy better than Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to fight, and by the way, why did he step from heaven to earth to fight? Like, like it was an invitation to go to war and who was he fighting for? You and I. He was fighting for our eternity. He was fighting for um, our victory over sin, over death, hell, and the grave. What was his fighting strategy? Jesus came to earth, I, I wanna say it like this, to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Jesus came full of grace and power. There, there was a strategy that Jesus used that we find in John chapter one, Pick it up in verse 14. It says, the word became flesh, that's Jesus Christ, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, how? Full of what? Grace and truth. There is the fighting strategy right there. Come on, say it with me again. He's full of what? Say it out loud. He's full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him saying, this is the one you guys I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. There's a tongue twister right there. Uh, but he was saying that I know this guy comes after me, but he was here in the very beginning. He was here way before me and now he's here to fight. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given to Moses, but look at this, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Are you fighting somebody today? Are you in a struggle today? Are you in an, an, an unwinnable argument today? Are, are you going toe to toe with somebody or something? Uh, I'd love for you just to kind of get in the corner of the ring and let me be your, your ring guy beside you and just give you a, a little bit of strategy when you go back in uh, to fight the next round. And, and you don't have to go in being anything except full of grace and truth. And if you will fight the way Jesus fights, let me just tell you, you will win the way Jesus won. And if Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth, how many think as followers of Jesus, we should be full of grace and truth? Some of us are full of something else, and it ain't grace and truth. Come on, we need to get full of grace and truth. Here's the one thing to know. The greatest fighting strategy is to fight with grace and truth. Grace is defense, truth is offense. You better have a good defense, and you better have a good offense. You better know how to stop the enemy from scoring, and you better know how to score on the enemy. You better walk in grace and you better walk in truth. You know, Jesus did this so beautifully. I, if you've never read the Gospels before, I encourage you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's easy to read about just the life of Jesus. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is that people were always trying to bait Jesus into a fight, always trying to bait him into an argument. You know how many times Jesus was asked a trap question, and what I mean by that is uh, a question to get him into a, a verbal fight? He was actually asked, uh, if you read the whole Gospels, 183 times Jesus was asked a question in the Gospels, 183 times. Do you know how many times he answered those questions? Three times. Jesus was asked a question 183 times and only answered three times, which tells me one thing, that just because someone has an opinion about something doesn't mean I need to give an answer to it. Just someone questions my motives or questions my perspective does not dictate that they get an answer for that question or for that answer. Jesus didn't get baited down into every question and every argument. Did you know you don't have to fight every fight that's out there? 
You know, the enemy is really good at baiting you into fights that you should never be in in the first place. I know this is crazy. Do you know you don't have to post on every comment that you don't like on social media? Do you know you don't have to? I'm not the biggest fan of social media, but one thing I like is that scroll thing. You can just scroll right past it. So you're like, well, people get on my nerves. Stop following them. Stop being baited into it. Just If it's getting on your nerves, just they even have like silent following now. You don't even have to let them know you stop following them. You just, you just kind of follow them on your own. Just listen, you have the power to not be baited into every argument. So 183 times religious people said, Jesus, what about this? What? And they didn't, they weren't looking for an answer. They were looking for a fight. Jesus didn't buy it. One of the greatest stories of how he used grace and truth was one time Jesus was preaching and ministering in John chapter eight. And there was a crowd of people that were just listening to him teach. And all of a sudden, the religious people were like, hey, let's get them and let's embarrass them in front of all these people listening. And so uh, something kind of crazy happened. They went and found this woman uh, who was in the act of adultery. Now, first of all, let that sink in just for a second. <laughs> Not after the act, the Bible says, in the act, in the act. Now, they only brought the woman to Jesus. And I'm like, she wasn't in the act by herself. That's all I know. And maybe it was because one of the people she was in action with was maybe one of those people. And she took the, they took the woman and dragged the woman in front of Jesus, threw the woman down, uh, probably half-dressed. I, I mean, this woman was caught in the most shameful, probably now lowest moment of her life. Maybe she was in that situation because of money. Maybe she was in that situation because she was forced to. I, I don't know. I'm not making excuses for the woman, but... But here she was caught, not on her best day, on one of her worst days at the worst moments, and they didn't even care about her. They were just trying to trap Jesus. They had no compassion on the woman. They, they just were using the woman uh, to create an argument with Jesus. So they brought the woman through the woman, right in the middle of Jesus' sermon, uh, throws the woman right in the front and says, Jesus, I got a question for you. It's one of the 183. He said, the Bible says in the Old Testament that if someone is caught in the act of adultery, that they should be stoned to death. And I believe they were, actually, I know they were, because you'll see the scripture, they're all holding rocks in their hands. We know what the law says. What do you say? This, this is like the gladiator Roman Colosseum moment where they had the rocks and they're waiting for Jesus to give a thumbs up or thumbs down. And they feel like they've got them either way. Because if he says thumbs up, then man, he's not here to be gracious. If he says thumbs down, he's definitely not here to help people out. And say, so what do we do? Is he going to be against the Old Testament or is this a new thing he's preaching? Um, and he wasn't baited. He didn't answer them. He ignored the question. It was a stupid question. He wasn't going to answer it. He didn't get baited. They got aggravated. How many know people will get aggravated when you don't, when you don't take the bait? That's on them. That's not on you. Let them be stressed out. You just keep doing your thing. So Jesus is kind of doing his thing, and they're like, they're, they demanded an answer. They demanded an answer. It doesn't say how long this process took, but it was enough to get them riled up. And, and then finally, Jesus uh, says something, but he doesn't give an answer. He dodges the question. He floats like a butterfly, but boy, he's about to sting like a bee. He, he's about to get out of the argument um, and, and, and kind of drop a jab of truth here. So pick up with me in verse seven, John 8, verse seven. He says this, he doesn't answer the question because the question was, do we kill her or not? Here's what he said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Um, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first and then the younger ones. Now, it does not say what he wrote on the ground. Many people assume it could be the sins that these gentlemen had in their life when they were about to stone this girl for her sin. And one of them walked away one at a time, one at a time. Jesus straightened up and asked her after everybody left, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Now, you gotta put yourself in her shoes. I, you gotta just assume she knew the law. She knew the rule. The moment she was caught, she knew she was done, Right? You ever, you ever been in that situation before where you're like, man, there's no, I know there's gonna be no grace or mercy here because I'm, you know, I was going 90 and a 35. There's not gonna be grace. And you see the lights coming behind like, I, 
This, this is the mindset she's in. She's on the ground. She's thinking the law, they're going to throw the book at me, right? And, uh, and Jesus says, hey, where's all the people that were ready to stone you? Where are they? Because I imagine her head was just down saying, just get this over with. I, I imagine she was like, just, you know, I'm, this is my last day. And she starts to look around and, and she says, no one, no one, sir. And then look what he says. I love this. Then neither do I condemn you. What was Jesus offering? Grace. What was Jesus doing? Floating like a butterfly. He, he was saying, hey, I don't, I don't judge you. I don't condemn you. I, I, I'm not here to throw stones at you. Now, my favorite part about this story is that Jesus didn't end the story with grace. He actually ended the story with truth. Because he didn't just say, hey, listen, no big deal. We're all sinners. No big deal. Me too. Like, we all do this. Uh, no big deal. Like, just, just, hey, listen, I don't judge you, so just go keep doing your thing. It's not what Jesus did. Jesus offered so much grace. And you know what grace does? Grace brings you in. But can I tell you, when you get brought in with grace, it is on you then to deliver some truth. And now in this moment of a lot of grace, how I many you know people don't care what you know until they know that you care? And, and here is Jesus, here's this lady like, oh, this dude cares. Oh, this dude could have ended my life and this dude just saved my life. I'm gonna listen to what this guy has to say. And Jesus followed up that grace with a lot of truth and said, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. What was Jesus doing? Jesus had two punches. He was full of grace, but he was also full of truth. He wasn't one without the other. He wasn't over the top grace with a little truth. He wasn't over top truth with a little bit of grace. Let me say it like this. Grace invites us in to be free, but it is the truth that can set us free. Think about that. Grace is what invites us in. It is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. You know, it's not a judgment, hellfire and brimstone that changes somebody. Uh, this is why a lot of churches get this wrong. A lot of churches uh, will get up and just tell everybody everything they're doing wrong and that they're going to hell. You say, why do we not do that here? Because people already know that, number one. And I was raised in a generation where I saw people get scared the hell out of. Like, literally, I, I, I see people like, I remember as a teenager going to church and they're like, man, if you like, hell, like the, the rapture and hell, I was scared every day that the rapture would, like, I would see my brothers, I knew they were going to hell with me. Like, I, I just knew it was like, I was scared. I, but can I tell you, fear never leads anybody to repentance. I saw that happen in church all the time. People would run to the altar crying and then they would be living the same way the next day because when fear goes away, and fear always comes and goes, when fear goes away, faith doesn't stay, right? And, and so I know this, true life change doesn't happen when you scare someone. True life change happens when you love someone. By the way, that's a great fighting strategy, right? Some of you are trying to scare people, intimidate people, and that never changes a situation or anything. If someone is scared of you, can I tell you, you may think that's cool. That's not cool. Like, like, and you're not gonna change anything. It's when someone, you know how you kill someone? You kill them with kindness. You love someone to change. Come on, if your life has been changed by Jesus, was, wasn't it because of how much grace he gave you? How much he loved you? Well, if God has given you that much grace, why would you not give it to someone else? And and, uh, and I love what it says in the same chapter, John 8, 32 says, then you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. Grace invites you in, but then the truth sets you free. Uh, and so when you're arguing with somebody, man, always start with grace. Always lay the foundation, I'm for you. Always lay the foundation that we're in this together. And then listen, then drop the truth. And you need to do both. And by the way, this is why the world doesn't understand how we do church. I'll make a statement about how we do church. Our church is like this. Everyone's welcome here. Everyone's welcome here. Anybody can come to our church. It does not matter who you vote for. You can come to our church. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter who you slept with. It doesn't matter what you smoked. It doesn't matter what you ate. Everyone is welcome to come here. Why? You know what that's called? 
Grace. I love that you clap for grace. Just don't forget to clap for the truth. Because grace says, grace says you're all welcome to come just as you are. Truth says no one should ever stay as you are. Truth says, truth says go and sin no more. And, and let me say this, grace calls you in. Truth calls you up. Listen, we have a lot of churches, people that get mad. It's like the cancel culture. And y'all said everyone's welcome, but then you're against this. No, we're not against anybody, but we will stand for what the Bible says about everything the Bible says we should stand for and be for. And, and so let me just say the world doesn't understand how we fight, but we fight with grace and truth. It was the Apostle Paul. You know, before Paul was Saul, Saul had all, he was, Saul was all intellect and no heart. Saul was all truth and no grace. Saul became Paul. Uh, when Jesus knocked Saul off his high horse. And, and by the way, uh, one of the greatest things God could ever do is knock you off your high horse. See, if you go into any argument, let me just, I'm trying to help you win in your marriage. I'm trying to help you win uh, because you may not do this like, 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 I know my wife's taking good notes today. That's what she's doing. But um, babe, look at me for a second. If we're having, if we're having a disagreement or an argument, you know, we're, we're like, you, you would go into that argument eye to eye, right? We're on the same level. Like, you're, I'm husband, you're wife, we're on the same level. But in my mind, if I think she's down there and I'm up here, in my mind, I'm like, I'm the superior, you're the inferior. In my mind, I know more than you know. In my mind, I'm better than you are. In my mind, I'm always right and you're always wrong. You've lost the fight before you even started. You've lost the fight. This is who Paul was. Paul would show up stoning Christians that he didn't even know. We're really good at throwing stones at people that we don't sit down and have a conversation with and, and having an eye to eye and just understand, hey, like maybe my perception's not always the right perception. Now, listen, Paul got saved. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Um, Paul started more churches and made a bigger, most theologians believe Paul was the greatest Christian of all time. Jesus is the best, but most people say Paul is right there, right behind him. Yet you'll never see Paul ever declaring himself the know-it-all. You'll never see, and listen, he could argue you, I promise you he knows the Bible. If you had to get in a theological argument with Paul, you losing, like you're gonna lose, right? He was a leader, he, but you'll never see him once declaring, I'm the greatest of all time. Actually, you will hear the other. He says, I'm the worst sinner of all time. He says, I'm the chief of sinners. And he would walk into every room understanding not only who he was, but the grace and why. Well, we get a little peek of it in 2 Corinthians 12. It says this, therefore, in order to keep me, is Paul talking, and, to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. Now, we don't know what the thorn was. It doesn't really matter. And by the way, I don't know what your thorn is. It doesn't really matter. What I know is, is that your weakness and Paul's weakness have the same thing. It's a messenger of Satan. And every one of us have thorns in our side. Every one of us has something that's tormenting us. Every one of us has something that we wish would stop itching or would go away. Like, like just, Lord, take this discomfort away. Take this inadequacy away. Take this insecurity away. Take this sinful thing away, whatever it is. And, and can I tell you, I, I don't know what yours is. I don't know what Paul's is, but I, I believe that the answer that God gave Paul is the same answer that God's given you. And look what he said, God, please take it away. And the Lord says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient. What was Jesus offering Paul? Grace. But he didn't stop there. He was also offering him some truth. For my power, grace and power, grace and truth, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And I'm here to tell somebody today, one of the best ways uh, to fight the good fight is go into every argument, everybody you're upset with or offended at and think, man, if it wasn't for the grace of God, where would I be? 
every time you get to rip somebody a new one, think about how God could do that to you and didn't. Every time you think like, like this, like I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna come in sweet, just remember what Jesus did for you. Because I think if you would have the mindset of Paul, man, I'm the chief of sinners. You know what you'll do? You'll write most of the Bible. I'm the chief of sinners. You'll plant more churches. I, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. But listen, I, I have a weakness, but in my weakness, he is strong. Come on, somebody. It is grace and truth. Let me make a couple more statements. Truth without grace is just mean. And grace without truth is meaningless. What, what? And let me just say this, because we, we, most people, I think, like, most people are bent one way or the other. Like, like you're really full of grace, uh, and, and you don't like to speak truth, or you really like truth, and you don't really care for the grace. Um, let me give you an example, because grace without truth is just, I mean, truth without grace is mean, um, but, but, but grace without truth is just meaningless. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever had a surgery before. I mean, how many, how many of you have ever gone under the knife? You ever heard that phrase? Like, nobody wants to go under the knife. What is the knife? The knife is truth. Truth what? Truth cuts you. But sometimes truth cuts you to heal you. Sometimes truth needs to cut things out of you. Sometimes truth needs to cut so things can go in you. But let me just say this. Like, can you imagine getting surgery under the knife with no anesthesia? And yet, that's how some of you have arguments with people all the time. You want to speak, I want to, truth hurts. Truth hurts. My thought is it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Because grace is an anesthesia that makes the truth acceptable to happen in your life. Truth doesn't have to be mean. Truth doesn't have to be painful. Truth can actually heal you and set you free if the right amount of grace or anesthesia is given. Can you imagine giving somebody anesthesia when they think they're going in for surgery and then they wake up and say, yeah, I didn't wanna cut you. I, I felt like it would hurt you. This actually happened to my dad. I, this happened about two years ago. My dad went to a surgery. Anesthesia put him out. They're ready to do the surgery and they forget a major tool component like uh, something that they were gonna use in the surgery and no one had it. They're looking around like, I thought you were gonna bring it. And they're like, I thought you were gonna bring it. And they had to wake him up and tell my mom two hours later, we gave him anesthesia, but we didn't do the surgery. Do you think my mom was happy at that moment? Y'all don't know my mom. mom. My mom ripped him a new one. Let me just tell you right now. Because how meaningless would it be to offer someone anesthesia when they think you're gonna give them surgery and yet you don't give them the surgery? How meaningless would it be to tell someone how great and how much you love them but never tell them like the thing that's in their life that needs to change that is the truth? Are you here with me today? This is what we try to do at church every Sunday. And, and let me just say, when you're having these tough conversations, just know, let me say what the truth says. Let me help you out with this. Truth says this. No one wants to hear this in church. Truth says you're a sinner. You're a sinner. Little exercise. If you're sitting beside someone you're married to or that you're family with, look them right in the eye and tell them you're a sinner. Come on, somebody, you're a sinner. Come on, some of y'all don't want to do this. I'm, some of you husbands are like, I am not. <laughs> Come on, dudes. Man up, Cortez, tell them. Now, wife, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at them and say, oh, I know. Come on, somebody, oh, I know. I don't even look at my, if I said, babe, I'm a sinner, she can be like, you don't even have to tell me, I know. Like, I know, I know. Can I tell you, we, we feel like in 2023, we can't tell people what they are anymore. Like, like but you can't tell you, like, that's truth. But let me give you the grace. Like, you're all sinners. Here's the grace. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Jesus is a friend of sinners. What is the prerequisite to being a friend of Jesus? A sinner. So if you don't admit that you're a sinner, you're forfeiting your ability to be friends with Jesus. This is why the religious people said, how dare you, Jesus, hang out at sinner's house? He goes, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. They didn't know how sick they were. 
they missed out on being a friend of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because he hung out with sinners and they didn't realize they were one too. Can I tell you, grace and truth go together. Truth without grace is condemnation. Grace without truth is compromise. You know, my prayer is today that we wouldn't fight one without the other. We'd go in both, both hands swing. And here's the one thing to do today. We gotta learn the ultimate combo, punch, by defending with grace and fighting with truth. We gotta defend with grace and fight with truth. I'm gonna quickly just give you some practical ways to do that today, whether it's in your marriage or your coworkers or friends. How, what does it look like to float like a butterfly, sting like a bee? Number one, you gotta guard your heart and speak the truth. You gotta guard your heart and speak the truth. What is guarding your heart? Floating like a butterfly. What is stinging like a bee? Speaking the truth. What do I mean by that? Do you know that your heart is, is the source of everything good and bad that comes out of your life? Everything. You know, when, when someone gets in the boxing ring, uh, like you can punch with both hands, but you can also defend with one and punch with the other. And, and can I tell you, like when you're in arguments or you're going through things, you need to do what Proverbs says. Proverbs 4 says, above all things, guard your heart. For above all things, everything you do flows out of it. Now, I know there's multiple causes of death, but really at the end of the day, there's only one cause of death, and that's heart failure. How do they determine someone is dead? Time of death, when what? The heart stops beating. And, and let me just say this, I, I'm not talking to your physical heart, I'm just talking to your well-being. Too many of us let the words and the opinions and the thoughts of other people offend us and get into our hearts. And if it gets into our heart, it will turn into anger, bitterness, and rage. This is why Paul says, get rid of all that stuff. Let me tell you what an offense is. You know what an offense is? It's a seed. That's all it is. When someone hurts you, lies to you, says something to you, it's a seed. You, they may say it to you, but you get to decide where that seed goes. You see, if I take a seed and throw it on this concrete ground, guess what's gonna happen to it? It's nothing. But too many of us take people's words and actions and we take it, and it's just a small little seed, and we plant it in the soil of our heart. We let it in. And when we do that, over time, that seed produces something, and it is not the fruits of the Spirit. It's actually the opposite. Lust, rage, hate, anger, all these things. I also can prove this over and over again. You know how many people I've sat with and said, my dad was this, and I'll never be that. And then they became exactly what they hated. Do you know how that happens? Because when you don't forgive something you hate, you become what you choose not to forgive. Oh, I'll never do that, and I'm gonna be mad at him my whole life. No, what you did is you just took his offense and you buried it in your heart, and then it produced something in your life that will do the same thing to your kids and their kids unless someone rises up and says, I'm gonna guard this heart. I'm gonna get out all that stuff. Not anymore. And I'm gonna speak the truth. Here's what the enemy does. Do you know why the enemy tries to get you offended and hurt? Because he knows this. Look at the next verse. Out of the heart, the what? The mouth speaks. So by the way, when someone says something hurtful to you, they're probably hurting. And by the way, you know how the enemy can use you is to get you hurt in your heart? So then guess what? Here's, how the, here's the trick of the enemy. And this is why we gotta float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Because if, if, if something hurts gets in your heart, guess what? Your heart will start hurting. But here's the trick of the enemy. The enemy knows that once this is hurt and offended, you're gonna start hurting and offending other people. Because whatever is in the heart speaks out of the mouth. That's why you gotta guard your heart and then speak the truth. Number two, here's the second way you gotta float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. You gotta be quick to forgive the offense and pray for the offender. Forgive the offense and pray for the offender unforgiveness, when you choose not to forgive, you're not knocking out your opponent, you're knocking out yourself. Unforgiveness is like, it's the knockout punch, but it's not the one you think, it's the one that keeps you down. When someone hurts you and you don't forgive, you're the one who stays on the ground. This is why the prayer, Matthew 6, 12, the Lord's Prayer, I mean, this is the model of how to pray. This is the Lord's Prayer, and right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer says, Father, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. I, I, I get asked to do weddings and counseling. You really don't want me to do either one. Uh, it's not really my forte, uh, and uh, I'll say some things at a wedding that go one ear in one ear and out the other. 
Um, and uh, one of the things I'll say is like this, you know, dearly beloved. Come on, that's my only chance I ever get to say, dearly beloved. But dearly beloved, we've gathered here today in the presence of God and all these people to see this man and this woman come together in holy marriage. Do you, do you, do you, all that stuff. And I say this, like, you know what brought those people? You know what brings you to an aisle? You know why you would show up and marry someone? You know what brings you to an aisle? Love, love, love. But then I say this and they don't really hear it. I'll say, my wife's laughing because she already knows. Like, I say, love, I try to say it in my princess bride voice, love, love. <laughs> Listen, true love, love, love brought us here today. And then I look at them and say, they don't want to hear it. Love brought you here, but it won't keep you here. Oh, you'll fall out of love, I, I promise you that. You'll find reasons not to Love brings you here, but it doesn't keep you. We've been married 25 years, and it ain't because of love. You can't hear her, but she's saying amen. Because here's why. Love brings you together, but forgiveness keeps you together. Forgiveness. We've been married 25 years, not because... She's loved me well or I've loved her well. No, no, no. It's because she's forgiven me well. And when needed be, not as much as I need about forgiving her well. It's grace that keeps us. Can I tell you, and it's the truth that sets us free. Because we, we offer grace to each other, but then we have to confront with the truth. But when it's done in the right way, it can save the relationship. And someone needs to hear that today. You need to forgive the offense but pray for the offender. And here's the last one. Bless the person and curse the enemy. How do you float like a butterfly? Oh, bless the person, but curse the enemy. We are so good at doing the opposite. We are great at cursing people. And we wouldn't say this, but you gotta know this is true. When you curse someone, you're actually blessing the enemy. You know, there's some things that have to go together. They have to. You know, every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something. Yet, just know every time the word no comes out of your mouth, yes is coming out too. Every time you say yes, so is no. So just know every time you curse something, you're blessing something too. Curses and blessings just go hand in hand. And what I mean by that is when I curse someone, and I'm not just talking about cussing them out. I'm just, I'm talking about just speaking death and negativity. And when I curse someone, I'm actually blessing the work of the enemy in the relationship and in the situation. So we got a choice to make. I can curse the person or I can curse the enemy and bless the person. Look what Romans 12 says before we end today. I love Romans 12. It says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Pray that God will bless them. But you don't, you don't know what they did to me. Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. Okay, you know what prayer does? Many people think prayer changes our circumstances. Really what prayer does is changes us. Some of you are trying to pray away an argument, pray away a situation, but what you'll do is if you'll pray the right way, it may not change your situation, but it will change you. And what many times needs to happen is your perception needs to change, not the situation. It is really hard to pray blessings on someone and be mad at them at the same time. It's just hard to do that. And when you pray blessings on someone, can I just tell you what you're really doing? You're speaking blessings on your own life. Matthew 18, truly I tell you, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. They go hand in hand. We're really good at binding people and loosening the enemy. We need to bind the enemy and loosen people. We need to bind the works of the enemy and let go of the offense, let go of the hurt, let go of the struggle. The cross of Jesus is the ultimate example of grace and truth. Grace says, I died for you. Grace says, I love you. Grace says, I've paid the price for your sin. But the truth says, nobody gets to heaven except through me. I hate to bring it to you, but Muhammad Ali is not the greatest of all time. I hate to break it to somebody, but Michael Jordan isn't the GOAT. It's not Money Mayweather. Come on, there is only one name that is above all other names, and that name should be lifted high.
and that name should be worship because his name is the greatest. Come on, somebody. Let's stand and let's sing your name. Come. Come on. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching the Destination Church YouTube channel. But don't stop there. Hit the like, the share button, and definitely subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with everything that we want to give you. Hey, if it's impacted your life, please pray about giving financially to help people find their destination in Christ. Hey, just know it's not about where you've been. It's where you're going that matters, and the best is yet to come.